Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at MICE. Uh, we are here to discuss comic scholarship and criticism. I'm your moderator, A. David Lewis. Uh, and my claim to fame, besides my first initial, is that I work in the area of uh, religious studies and comic books. In fact, coming in spring of 2017, we have Muslim superhero uh, comics, Islam, and representation coming out with my co-editor, Martin Lund. So I get the honor of moderating and posing all sorts of questions to these, our excellent panelists who will introduce themselves to you now. And um, for uh, six years, I was an English professor at the University of Chicago. And last year, I was a visiting professor in the English department at Harvard. And um, it was a real pleasure for me because I taught the Harvard English department's first ever dedicated course, both at the graduate and undergraduate level, on the graphic novel. So that was really interesting and really gratifying. And um, I uh, have published um, three books. So um, one of them is part of the packet for the winner of the prize it's called Disaster Drawn, and it came out um, this year. I published a book of interviews with cartoonists called Outside the Box, and I published a book in 2010 called Graphic Women, Life Narrative and Contemporary Comics. Great book. Yes. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> and I worked with Art Spiegelman on a book called Venom Mouse for six years. Um, as associate editor, and this is a book about the 13-year process that he went through of um, composing that. So by working with you, he extended the 13 <laughs> years an to extra six? Years. <laughs> okay. If he hadn't been working with me, it would have been an extra, you know, 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Karen Green. I'm a librarian at Columbia University. Uh, I was hired as a librarian for Ancient and Medieval History, which is uh, a job I still actually hold, although fewer and fewer people would, would acknowledge that these days. In 2005, I created our graphic novels collection and became the self-styled uh, graphic novels librarian. Uh, we had three graphic novels in my library in 2005. We now have roughly 11,000 titles in 15 languages. Uh, that circulate, all of these circulate. Um, in 2010, I branched into archives when Chris Claremont approached us and offered us his archives. And uh, I'm now the adjunct curator for comics and cartoons in our Rare Book <coughs> Manuscript Library, uh, where we've added to Chris with Al Jaffe, uh, Crater of the Folden, his papers, uh, the Kitchen Sink Press archives, which include roughly 50,000 letters from everyone Dennis Kitchen ever corresponded with as the founder of Kitchen Sink Press from 1969 onwards. Um, we just added the papers of Howard Cruz, father of gay comics. Uh, we have an amazing collection of over 2,100 pieces of editorial cartoon art. <laughs> editorial cartoon art going back to Thomas Nast. Uh, and when I, when I started the collection, nobody that I knew of was teaching or doing research in comics, but I had a kind of, if I build it, they will come mentality. And uh, it's proved to be true. We now have a course on the American graphic novel that's taught every other year. Uh, we have a number of master students in American studies doing comic studies. Uh, Matteo Faranella, the co-author of Neurocomic, uh, has just been uh, brought in as a presidential scholar for a three-year postdoc in the Center for Science and Society. Um, and I've got even classics professors coming to me and saying, oh, can I design a course on history and comics? <laughs> you sure can. So uh, I don't do much scholarship personally. I'm more of a popular writer. But uh, I, I facilitate scholarship, and that is Usually. extremely exciting. And given that this is a, a MICE crowd, I feel uh, beholden as the moderator to point out that Chris Claremont was writer of a small uh, superhero comic called X-Men, 
for a number of years. <laughs> this may be obscure to some of you, but it, it feels worth calling it. Yeah, I mean, 17 years, and uh, all the movie plots. A scant 17 years and everything that's made it to Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. And all he's right. a nice guy. And he's done indie stuff, too. He's done that's true. creator on the work. So he's... <laughs> Forrest, please. And my name is Forrest Halvey, and I wish I had taken Hillary's offer to go first. <laughs> um, I, I don't have any any uh, academic books published yet. I do have one that I'm, I've been working on slowly. Uh, I've spent a lot of time kind of dipping my hands into a variety of different areas. Uh, I'm an English professor, so I do use comics in my classroom. Uh, I've, I've published a lot of different articles, contributions uh, on comic studies, a host of subject matter. Uh, but I also write for Marvel, I write for news dramas, like Karen mentioned, I do a lot of popular writing as well, um, in addition to writing children's comics. As, and so I kind of have my hands in every pot that I can get my hands into so I can learn as much about the field. Um, but again, you know, my, my, my interests vary, so it goes from the mainstream mm -hmm. to the independent. And um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to talking a little bit about what comic studies are. Okay, so, the, so thank you you to the three of you for being here uh, today and of course to Mice and Dan Mazur for uh, allowing us to have this chance. Gradually we will open this to questions that you may have but and uh, towards the end of our time today we're actually going to be awarding two prizes to, oh, to none of you, <laughs> uh, to actually nominees for best online comic study scholarship. B-O-C-S-S, -S, or Box, uh, done in 2015. So the assemblage of books you see up on the table have been graciously donated by the exhibitors of MICE to that award. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today at MICE. Uh, we are here to discuss comic scholarship and criticism. I'm your moderator, A. David Lewis. Uh, and my claim to fame, besides my first initial, is that I work <laughs> in the area of uh, religious studies and comic books. In fact, coming in spring of 2017, we have Muslim superhero uh, comics, Islam, and representation coming out with my co-editor, Martin Lund. So I get the honor of moderating and posing all sorts of questions to these, our excellent panelists, who will introduce themselves to you now. <laughs> And um, for uh, six years, I was an English professor at the University of Chicago. And last year, I was a visiting professor in the English department at Harvard. And um, it was a real pleasure for me because I taught the Harvard English department's first ever dedicated course, both at the graduate and undergraduate level, on the graphic novel. So that was really interesting and really gratifying. And um, I uh, have published um, three books. So um, one of them is part of the packet for the winner of the prize it's called Disaster Drawn, and it came out um, this year. I published a book of interviews with cartoonists called Outside the Box, and I published a book in 2010 called Graphic Women, Life Narrative, and Contemporary Comics. Great book. Yes. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> and I worked with Art Spiegelman on a book called Metamouse for six years. Um, as associate editor, and this is a book about the 13-year process that he went through of um, composing that. So by working with you, he extended the 13 <laughs> years and extra six? <laughs> okay. If he hadn't been working with me, it would have been an extra, you know, 10 years. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Karen Green. I'm a librarian at Columbia University. Uh, I was hired as a librarian for Ancient and Medieval History, which is uh, a job I still actually hold, although fewer and fewer people would, would acknowledge that these days. In 2005, I created our graphic novels collection, 
and became the self-styled uh, graphic novels librarian. Uh, we had three graphic novels in my library in 2005. We now have roughly 11,000 titles in 15 languages uh, that circulate. All of these circulate. Um, in 2010, I branched into archives when Chris Claremont approached us and offered us his archives. And uh, I'm now the adjunct curator for comics and cartoons in our Rare Book <coughs> Manuscript Library, uh, where we've added to Chris with Al Jaffe, uh, creator of Holden, his papers, uh, the Kitchen Sink Press archives, which include roughly 50,000 letters from everyone Dennis Kitchen ever corresponded with as the founder of Kitchen Sink Press from 1969 onwards. Um, we just added the papers of Howard Cruz, author of Gay Comics. Uh, we have an amazing collection of over 2,100 pieces of editorial cartoon art. <laughs> editorial cartoon art going back to Thomas Nast. Uh, and when I, when I started the collection, nobody that I knew of was teaching or doing research in comics, but I had a kind of, if I build it, they will come mentality. And uh, it's proved to be true. We now have a course on the American graphic novel that's taught every other year. Uh, we have a number of master students in American studies doing comic studies. Um, Matteo Faranella, the co-author of Neurocomic, uh, has just been uh, brought in as a presidential scholar for a three-year postdoc in the Center for Science and Society. Um, and I've got even classics professors coming to me and saying, oh, can I design a course on history and comics? <laughs> you sure can. So uh, I don't do much scholarship personally. I'm more of a popular writer. But uh, I, I facilitate scholarship. And that is Usually. extremely exciting to me. And given that this is a, a mice crowd, I feel uh, beholden as the moderator to point out that Chris Claremont was writer of a small uh, superhero comic called X-Men for a number of years. <laughs> this may be obscure to some of you, but it, it feels worth calling it. Yeah, 17 years, and uh, all the movie plots. A scant 17 years and everything that's made it to Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. And right. he's a nice guy. And he's done indie stuff, too. He's done that's like true. creator on the board. So he's <laughs> Forrest, please. And my name is Forrest Halvey, and I wish I had taken Hillary's offer to go first. <laughs> um, I, I don't have any any uh, academic books published yet. I do have one that I'm, I've been working on slowly. Uh, I've spent a lot of time kind of dipping my hands into a variety of different areas. Uh, I'm an English professor, so I do use comics in my classroom. Uh, I've, I've published a lot of different articles, contributions, uh, comic studies and most of the subject matter. Uh, but I also write for Marvel, I write for news dramas, like Karen mentioned, I do a lot of popular writing as well, um, in addition to writing children's comics. And so I kind of have my hands in every pot that I can get my hands into so I can learn as much about the field. Um, but again, you know, my, my, my interests vary, so it goes from the mainstream to the independent. And um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to talking a little bit about what comic studies are. Okay, so the, so thank you to the three of you for being here uh, today, and of course to Mice and Dan Mazur for uh, allowing us to have this chance. Gradually, we will open this to questions that you may have, but and uh, towards the end of our time today, we're actually going to be awarding two prizes to oh, to none of you. <laughs> uh, to actually nominees for best online comic study scholarship, B-O-C-S-S, -S, or BOX, uh, done in 2015. So the assemblage of books you see up on the table have been graciously donated by the exhibitors of MICE to that award. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today at MICE. Uh, we are here to discuss comic scholarship and criticism. I'm your moderator, 
A. David Lewis. Uh, and my claim to fame, besides my first initial, is that I work <laughs> in the area of uh, religious studies and comic books. In fact, coming in spring of 2017, we have Muslim superhero uh, comics, Islam, and representation coming out with my co-editor, Martin Lund. So I get the honor of moderating and posing all sorts of questions to these, our excellent panelists who will introduce themselves to you now. So by working with you, he extended the 13 years an <laughs> extra six? Years. <laughs> okay. If he hadn't been working with me, it would have been an extra, you know, 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Karen Green. I'm a librarian at Columbia University. Uh, I was hired as a librarian for ancient and medieval history, which is uh, a job I still actually hold, although fewer and fewer people would, would acknowledge that <laughs> these days. In 2005, I created our graphic novels collection and became the self-styled uh, graphic novels librarian. Uh, we had three graphic novels in my library in 2005. We now have roughly 11,000 titles in 15 languages uh, that circulate. All of these circulate. Um, in 2010, I branched into archives when Chris Claremont approached us and offered us his archives and uh, I'm now the adjunct curator for comics and cartoons in our Rare Book Manuscript <coughs> Library, uh, where we've added to Chris with Al Jaffe, uh, Crater of Holden, his papers, uh, the Kitchen Sink Press archives, which include roughly 50,000 letters from everyone Dennis Kitchen ever corresponded with as the founder of Kitchen Sink Press from 1969 onwards. Um, we just added the papers of Howard Cruz, father of gay comics. Uh, we have an amazing collection of over 2,100 pieces of editorial cartoon art. <laughs> editorial cartoon art going back to Thomas Nast. Uh, and when I, when I started the collection, nobody that I knew of was teaching or doing research in comics, but I had a kind of, if I build it, they will come. <laughs> And uh, it's proved to be true. We now have a course on the American graphic novel that's taught every other year. Uh, we have a number of master students in American studies doing comic studies. Uh, Matteo Fadanella, the co-author of Neurocomic, uh, has just been uh, brought in as a presidential scholar for a three-year postdoc in the Center for Science and Society. Um, and I've got even classics professors coming to me and saying, um, oh, can I design a course on history and comics? <laughs> you sure can. So uh, I don't do much scholarship personally. I'm more of a popular writer. But uh, I, I facilitate scholarship. And that is Usually. extremely exciting to me. Yeah. And given that this is a, a mice crowd, I feel uh, beholden as the moderator to point out that Chris Claremont was writer of a small uh, superhero comic called X-Men for a number of years. This may be obscure to some of you, but it, it feels worth calling it. Yeah, 17 years, and uh, all the movie plots. A scant 17 years and everything that's made it to Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. 
And he's a nice guy. And he's done indie stuff too. He's done That's creator true. owned work. So he's <laughs> Forrest, please. And my name is Forrest Talvey, and I wish I had taken Hillary's offer to go first. <laughs> um, I, I don't have any any uh, academic books published yet. I do have one that I'm, I've been working on slowly. Uh, I've spent a lot of time kind of dipping my hands into a variety of different areas. Uh, I'm an English professor, so I do use comics in my classroom. Uh, I've, I've published a lot of different articles, contributions uh, on comic studies, a host of subject matter. Uh, but I also write for Marvel. I write for news dramas, like Karen mentioned. I do a lot of popular writing as well. Um, in addition to writing children's comics. As, so I kind of have my hands in every pot that I can get my hands into so I can learn as much about the field. Um, but again, you know, my, my, my interests vary, so it goes from the mainstream mm -hmm. to the independent. And um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to talking a little bit about what comic studies are. Okay, so, the, so thank you to the three of you for being here uh, today, and of course to Mice and Dan Mazur for uh, allowing us to have this chance. Gradually, we will open this to questions that you may have, but, and uh, towards the end of our time today, we're actually going to be awarding two prizes to, oh, oh, to none of you, <laughs> uh, to actually nominees for Best Online Comic Studies Scholarship, B-O-C-S-S, -S, or BOX, uh, done in 2015. So the assemblage of books you see up on the table have been graciously donated by the exhibitors of MICE to that award. I want to begin with a singular question that I think the panelists have already danced around beautifully. When you were invited here today to talk about comic studies and comic scholarship, what did or do you think that is? Karen and Forrest already suggested that they write popularly, so is that comic studies scholarship? Does it have to be published? Does it have to be performed by a professor? I'd love to hear your own feelings about where comic studies resides. Well, I mean, to me, one of the exciting things about um, studying comics and writing about comics is the kind of pressure that I feel like comics places on um, you know um, certain boundaries like you know, what's academic what's sort of like merely popular so I started off um, writing about comics for the village voice and it was at that time that I was also writing my dissertation about comics and it felt like similar projects and I think it's because comics is a form that can be so accessible and yet so sophisticated that it actually bridges a lot of these different spaces in terms of um, is it scholarship or journalism, you know, who's the audience for this kind of writing. That's fair, that's fair. And Karen, when you started, you said you had to build it and they will come mentality. Have, have they come? They have come. Uh, I, I work with a number of faculty uh, who are teaching. We have a, a master's program uh, called Narrative Medicine, which is about teaching uh, healthcare professionals how to listen to people's narratives about their illness. Um, if you've read uh, Leela Corman's recent online comic uh, about her, her two birth experiences, uh, which is so profoundly moving, there's this uh, <coughs> obstetrician screams at her five times about how he won't be responsible if she doesn't take this specific medication. And we actually uh, started a reading group uh, just this week, and we read that, and I said, this is a guy who could have used the narrative medicine course. So they're very into comics there. They're very, they're very into illness narratives. And they brought in uh, David Small to speak, and they hosted graphic medicine um, conferences. So uh, it's already happening. And I actually, I forgot to mention, I teach a summer course uh, that I inherited from a, a PhD candidate in the English department who went on to finish and get a job. And when he got he left, they asked me if I would take over his course. Now, Hillary and, and Forrest are both in English departments. I was trained as an historian. I was trained as a medieval historian. Uh, and suddenly I was given this course syllabus that was all about literary theory. Um, 
I wasn't really big on theory even as an historian. So I, yeah, so I turned it into a close reading course uh, to, you know, we start obviously with things like understanding comics and uh, Paul Karasek and Mark Newgarden's How to Read Nancy and Art Spiegelman's piece on reading uh, Christine's Master Race. So they have kind of a vocabulary and then we kind of go through genre, we go through history and then we go through genre. Um, and uh, it's, it's intriguing to see them become more sophisticated in reading the medium. The medium can be read on so many levels. You know, you can read it simply as a story or you can concentrate on how that panel, how that page was composed and laid out. What are the choices that the artist made that are causing you to experience the story that are part of a, a meta-narrative? Um, so it's, it's one of the most interesting things is that most of the students are not comics readers when they come in. And I had one student this past summer, I've had it four years now, who was a huge X-Men fan, actually. Huge X-Men fan, and he wanted to do his final paper on an X-Men story, and he was struggling because he always read comics for the story. Mm -hmm. And he never read it as to understand the medium. And um, so comic studies, to get back to your question, Comic studies can be approached through many lenses and can take, I think, many guises. And uh, I think anything that causes people to think more intelligently or more analytically or more critically about the work that, that you guys are all doing um, can be considered comic studies. Let me change the trajectory of the question for before we get to you, Forrest, um, I think we're acknowledging that comic studies has been operational for some time as orbits around other disciplines. That you could do look at comics in terms of the history department, in terms of the English department, in terms of visual arts or art studies. I suppose I'm interested in what your thoughts are on comic studies as itself, as its own orbit, as having an academic discipline. Well, as an academic discipline, or its own field, or its own like specialty. Like its own field of arts coverage and journalism, or its own field in academia. It, I, think I think that's why I started answering that type of question. Because when I hear studies appended to anything, I tend to think of academia. Yes, I think in, I think I'm thinking of academia, but I don't mean to limit it. There. Okay. You know, one thing it's interesting you mentioned that you were working in more popular writing outlets while you're doing your dissertation. Yeah. I was doing the same thing. Yeah. And for me, it was it's a, good. And a lot of people look at me like I was crazy. They're like, oh, you're writing a dissertation and you're writing weekly articles for Young News Rama. And I'm like, yeah, it kind of helps keep me fresh and or get the crazy look. You know, you should just focus on writing one thing at a time. Um, but it was, and this actually does go right into your question, yeah. you know, because one of the things I found is that anytime I would write a paper, you know, whether it was grad paper or anything like that for my, you know, English courses. I would really focus hard on the all the traditional narrative elements, right, and conduct my my analysis from that perspective. And anytime I did that, my editors would hammer me on the head and say, "Look, that's nice. You also have the art that you have to focus on." And so I'd have to go out and do some study, you know, picking up art books and learning about color theory and how do all these things factor into this book that I'm reading. I would also notice that linguists, when they picked it up, would look at the structural right. elements and uh, uh, even neurocognitive work on it focuses right. on the symbology and the semiotics of it. So, as and you're saying, that was one of the things that was interesting, you know. So, I would sit back and be interviewing these different creators, mm -hmm. and instead of just like, you know, what can you tease us for next issue, it would be really digging hard into the process of how did you make this? And talk to me about this. What was the decision making behind this? Uh, how does this all fit together? And, and they really enjoyed it because they actually got to dig into the dirt of the crap, you know, uh, which they didn't feel like they got to do much. It helped me learn a lot about it. And then I would take that experience, okay, I'm, I've got my breath caught up for my, my doctoral work, and I dig into that. And the result was I provided much, I think, I'd like to think I provided more comprehensive, close reading of my doctoral study uh, subjects. Hillary, you made, you made an interesting point that I think appends to, to Forrest's point. Namely, when I was coming from my own biased uh, angle here, 
I tend to think of comic studies in terms of. I wasn't of, calling you out I, I feel horribly <laughs> put on the spot. The <laughs> um, no, no, no. I, I don't feel put on the spot at all. Uh, but what I was going to ask next was what field does comic studies currently feel like it's evolving similarly to? Oh, I now, I'm realizing the problem with that question is that I'm thinking in terms of academic fields almost exclusively, so maybe we could... Focus on that for a moment? Either or focus on that or expand it into how are comics now being covered in a more mature journalistic sense? Well, just to answer his question briefly, so um, I think that when Bob Dylan recently won the Nobel <laughs> Prize for Literature, uh -huh. this was actually a big moment for comic studies. I agree. Because... Um, what we saw happening on this very mainstream global stage is a sense of what literature is being opened up. And to me, one of the things that's been so gratifying being a scholar of comics is how, this, is, this sort of rhymes with my point from before, um, how comics is always placing pressure on um, things that seem discreet. Mm -hmm. So I think comics um, should be studied in English departments, and that's my field. I think they should also be studied in all sorts of other departments. I think comics places a lot of productive pressure on what we consider literature, and what we consider art, and what we consider narrative. And so um, I think there's something great about the fact that comics is always making people uncomfortable that way. Could comic studies do itself a disservice then by establishing a home base, establishing its own Department of Comic Studies? Well, Would like that in, walk in one it off? university? I mean, what's the it there? <laughs> I don't know. What is the it there? Um, yes. In, would pushing for a discreet right, like set a department of departments? Of comic studies. Yes. Well, you know, in the 60s, film studies were where comic studies are kind of now. To a great extent, they were part of English departments. Yep. Um, they weren't necessarily looked at as serious. Or art departments, right? Or art departments, right. right. Um, and and I, I think, and I think uh, our two faculty here can probably back this up, that um, when an English department gets to expand its, or when any department gets to expand its scope, bringing in more students, being able to add more faculty, uh, they're not always so willing to allow that to spin off. You know, they're going to lose enrollment, they're going to lose numbers. Um, and I think it took a while for film studies to spin off, to be, to like reach a critical mass where it had to spin off and become its own department because it is so inherently interdisciplinary. It's, it's, it can be researched through so many different disciplinary lenses. Um, I don't think comic studies is there yet. Mm -hmm. But I think we are moving fast. Um, you know, Ben Saunders has established a minor in comic studies at Oregon, and there's another university that just announced that San Diego. San Diego. San Francisco or San Diego? San Francisco. San Francisco. has a new minor. There's another minor in comic studies that's just been uh, established. Um, and we'd be remiss to overlook the Center for Cartoon Studies doing the vocational work, right? Like right. comic studies. Right, which is a whole other area. Yeah. Which exactly. Is it's incredible. Sequential art workshop, and you mm -hmm. know, there's all these places that are that are training more cartoonists to go out. Um, so uh, going back to the film studies analogy, film studies has not remained confined to academia. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of people writing about film from uh, a heavily informed and critical standpoint, but not necessarily an academic standpoint. That's fair. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, it, it seems like confining it just to academics really puts it behind the eight ball in some regards. I mean, I know we have we have some areas where they're opening up, but I'm, I'm just recalling a conversation like we were engaged in a couple months ago online, it was an article uh, Bart Beatty wrote about how comic studies is the privilege of the full and tenured professor. Um, and, and, and the truth of the matter is, I mean, I was told point blank during my comprehensive exams that I was really interested in pursuing uh, an exploration of you know, who gets to be super in, in America. 
and that sounds great, but you're really good at writing about this field, and that's comics aren't really marketable. And I was like, well, I have a tenure track job, so I'm going to be writing this. And they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's and it's it's if you look at the job market, there are not as many faculty positions for comic studies. So you you as an English professor kind of get yourself established, and it's then you can begin writing about what you want to write. Look at me, Suzanne. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Just to point out something really quickly, when I got my um, tenure track and then tenure job at the University of Chicago, it was not a job that was being advertised for comic studies. It was a job that was being advertised for 20th century American right. literature. Exactly. And I applied to it with my project on comics and I got it. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something nice about the fact that people studying comics study images and they study words and they study narrative and they can apply to all sorts of different kinds of jobs. Yeah, and I'm not they don't have to be officially comic studies jobs. And, and I'm not saying that there's not space, but I'm just saying that I think the, the problem of anchoring is strictly in academics is that there's still a lot of areas to grow. And, oh, yeah. you know, there are more and more open-minded people, but I think that's one of the benefits of having, you know, um, cartoon studies, which is outside of the traditional venues, mm -hmm. and having, you know, comic studies being located in this journalism space, you know. I think I we can... have to talk about Nick Susannas. Um, okay, yeah, Nick Susannas. You know, Nick Susannas did his PhD at Columbia at our teacher's college. He wanted to write about um, kind of the ways that we teach and how rote they are and using visuals to break teaching out of these ruts. And he's a cartoonist and he wrote his entire dissertation as a comic. Um, Teachers College allowed him to do this. Uh, he got written up in the Chronicle of education, Higher Education and within a month of defending his dissertation he had three uh, book contract offers. Most notably that um, it's Harvard well, they were all academic. It was Harvard, Oxford, and one other. But ultimately, Columbia, went Columbia. with Harvard, and that was their first graphic novel right. under yeah. their imprint. And then, you know, a year later, I had the first comics criticism That's book coming out from Harvard. I kept telling them, you should run an ad with me and Nick together. <laughs> <laughs> you really should. So he went on to get a postdoc, actually, with Bart Beatty. Right. Um, and now he's on faculty at San Francisco State University. He's got a tenure track job. and. Nobody's going to look at Nick as anything but comic studies. <laughs> right. Now, I could either uh, mansplain to Karen's response, or we could open the uh, floor to questions. I'd much rather do the latter, because the former is just totally abhorrent to me. Yes? There's a third option. What's the third option? No, no, no. There's a very strict option. <laughs> Not mansplaining. Oh, fine. Yeah, I guess I'll just skip this. I was just going to say that the. the um, no, uh, no offense if there is a decent amount of gray hair up here. And there's another problem with thinking of, uh, of comic studies as something that could follow that film studies model, which I would love to see it uh, in a perfect world. But I mean, there are just not I mean, every Every time a professor dies, it's just, let's, let's say three professors die, being one tenure track job gets reopened. That's very true. And the yeah. yeah, that's that's very true. university is going yeah. to be very much problematic for trying to expand new into new disciplines that Yeah, I, I I agree. Academia is a is a tough racket. Um, on the other hand, I think that especially in um, humanities divisions, universities, all sorts of different kinds of universities are seeing numbers go down. <coughs> and so in a way that seems different from the past ten years or even the past five years, I feel like universities are listening to students and what students are interested in in a new way because they want their enrollments to either go up or at least stay steady. So I think that's part of the reason there's this sort of fresh interest in comic courses, for example. But the other thing is, is that, um, yes, it's true. Three old folks retire and one person gets a tenure track job. That opens two adjuncts and adjuncts tend to teach courses that are more on the fringes. They, they can do things that are more experimental. Um, so it, it opens up possibilities, really, for more comics-related courses. I don't think I don't think there's safety, absolute safety, and job security out there yet. If you are just uh, trying to make the transition from studies into profession, whether that's academic or journalistic or or so forth, but uh, there are some early structures forming, not the least of which is panels like these. 
Uh, I'd also like to point to the Comic Study Society. Uh, we now know who we are. And instead of operating as independent uh, entities, you now can count over 500 strong members across institutions worldwide uh, that might be able to offer help, tips, grants, as well as the CSS also uh, coming up with its own uh, grants and funding as it proceeds. So it, it, if things feel bleak, they're at least less bleak. Well, one of the things that really, that's interesting about that is that, that that group is not made up strictly of teaching faculty. Exactly. And, and I'm not trying to knock the, the gains that I think, I, I'm, I'm encouraged to see a lot of colleges, you know, David sent an email to us kind of thinking like, what's some of the high watermarks? And Nick was the first thing I thought of, you know, in terms of we have a, a, a comic for one of us who, who has their dissertation from an established institution in comics form and then published by one of the definitive universities out there, right? And I think that's fantastic. But what really interests me about comic studies, I think kind of cuts a little bit to your question, and that is that it's not just academics, you know. And what's really interesting to me is that, you know, when you when I had when I was a grad student and I was just trying to get some some journal, you know, articles published, or I was trying to get into a collection of group one thoughts, I would have to send my resume, I would have to talk about my background and why I was qualified to write for them. Um, and it's not that more popular venues don't require some level of you know writing samples. But that's what I was asked for from more mainstream sites. What, give me a sample of your writing. Show me what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, and then the result was that I would write something and it would go out to 10,000 people versus 10. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, that's so pressure. Um, yeah. and, and, and that has its whole unique you know, experience. Um, but I sit and think about the different people that I look to and that I read. When I go online, I'm like, there's something going on in comics. I want to go. I, Generally, don't look to academic publications right away. I look, you know, Heidi McDonald is one of my favorite writers, and she's not a professor that I'm aware of. Um, but she has some amazing insights, incredibly smart, has been all over the place in terms of the industry. Right, Tom Spurgeon's another excellent example, and these are not your traditional venues. And that's what I like so much about comic studies is that it has different access points than the traditional academic <coughs> publication route has. Um, yeah, of course, and I think few academics would, would look to an academic journal for, um, you know, a response when something new comes out, right? So I, if I it's was, not peer-reviewed, I'm not I really was, <laughs> I don't, you know, academics, um, I wasn't trying to promote academia over journalism or anything. In fact, I totally agree with you, yeah. It's just, I, I like the fact that it's just, Common Studies has that, that accessibility. Yeah, I think you know? you're, you're saying that there are different access points, mm -hmm. so it really makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there was the column that I wrote for Comixology. Um, I, had, I had started the collection, as I mentioned, in 2005, and I didn't know a lot of other academic libraries with collections, and I wanted to kind of get advice on how best to make selections, because <laughs> the way that comics were reviewed at the time, and still to a great extent, uh, is really more for public libraries. You know, what age range is this appropriate for? You know, where are you going to shelve it? Not an issue at Columbia. Um, so I had gone to a, a publishing event on uh, comics and the future of publishing that was uh, sponsored by Publishers Weekly and hosted by Random House. And I asked a question during the Q&A. It's like, what are you doing to help academic libraries build these collections? And uh, nobody had a good answer, but I had a line of people uh, waiting to talk to me afterwards, and one of them was one of the founders of Comixology, so before they had gone into digital comics when they were still kind of a, an electronic pull list. Um, and they had columns, and they asked me to write a column about comics and academia. So for four and a half years, I wrote a monthly column about how comics get used in the academy, or how can they be used in the academy. And uh, it was great fun, and it uh, I think raised the profile of Comics as a as a as a medium worthy of study, um, and I wouldn't consider it scholarly writing, but I would definitely consider it part of comic studies. So yeah. So I welcome points. additional questions from the. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Please. It sounds like a lot of comics academic academic work is mostly about stuff like Mouse and Persepolis and Picture Super Richard and things like that. Do you think that as we move on, there will be more scholarship about the kind of stuff? Yes. Yes. I think it's already happening. 
Um, I mean, that's one of the things we're trying to promote today by making the prize package for good yeah. scholarship, yeah. good yeah. independent yeah. comics. Like covering web comics and stuff academically, is that also all here? I, th I think that is opening up yeah, already. I, I, yeah, I was on a panel at the Modern Language Association, which is you know, the big annual association for people in literature um, on, on web comics. So, I mean, stuff is starting to happen there. I mean, I think when the work is good, the people will come, right? Yeah. Like, from yeah. anywhere. So, just speaking sort of like for academia, nobody is, nobody is, no journal editors, um, university press editors think we only want um, work on maps. They think what's the most trenchant analysis? And, you know, historically that's landed on certain really sophisticated, really great objects, but that's not to say that um, the focus only has to be there. This is something that Park Beatty and Benjamin Wu's latest book uh, touched upon. They uh, released this book, I believe it's called The Greatest Superhero, uh, The Greatest Comic Book of All Time. And chapter by chapter, they explore what could be the greatest comic book of all time, and then knock it down. Every chapter, they say, could it be Mouse? Well, here's why it could be Mouse, but here's why it might not be. Could it be Rob Leefield's no. Young Blood? No, 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 no. <laughs> and then they knock it down, Karen. Uh, could it be Persepolis? So um, the thing I like about that book is it acknowledges all the different values that we assign to uh, uh, genres and material levels of the work. Um, and then they write well on all of it. Yeah, I think you have to write well. That's, yeah. that's, that's the point that's here. The <laughs> you know, when I, um, when I proposed the comics collection in 2005, I had to come up with arguments as to why this would be a good thing, when actually my motivation was I couldn't afford to buy everything that I wanted to read. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I felt would not fly. So I needed to come up with something that would be more appropriate. And I went to um, the database, the MLA bibliography, and I started looking not for Art Spiegelman, because yes, everybody <laughs> writes about Art Spiegelman. That's not a risk to write about Art Spiegelman. But I was it's looking It's not for like it's easy to get published, though, writing about that. No, right? I mean, course. I think sometimes the, the way people talk about it no. gets simplified. Okay. I, not easy not specifically, yeah, but exactly. Um, but I was looking for peer-reviewed journals that had articles on Chris Ware. Now, today that may not seem so weird, but in 2005, he was still. Yeah, there's still not a lot of journal articles. About there's Chris still Ware. not a lot, but the, but I found them. I found them, um, and I wanted to, to use this to prove because we already had Mouse in the library. I didn't have to make a justification for Mouse in the library. I wanted to make a justification for a, a broader swath of the medium. Um, so I was looking for more marginal, uh, non-mainstream authors, and I found, I found scholarship. So don't worry, <laughs> it's only going to get better. We have another question up front here. Yeah, I was just wondering if part of the issue is the, the word comics and people's association with the, the Sunday funnies as opposed to actual literary works. I think that really is an issue, but I, I don't want to stop using the word comics. Um, Why not? Why not? Yeah. Because I, I'm not ashamed, and I think a lot of cartoonists are not ashamed, and in fact they're proud of the connection of this medium to like mass circulating who think of the turn of the century. Um, I'm, so, I'm more concerned about the term graphic novels, mm -hmm. to be frank. Because um, it's meaningless. It's, it's an empty I, term. I don't think it's meaningless. It's, it's, it's a, a publishing term. term. It's a marketing term. It's a, it's a, term. Format, it's right? a uh, marketing term. But it's not meaningless. For example, when sections were created in bookstores, the BISAC um, created a new section for graphic novels in bookstores, that was huge. That meant that certain kinds of works could be legible to certain audiences. So to me, it's not meaningless at all. It's not um, the be all end all. I actually don't like or use the term, but um, I don't think it's meaningless. Well, okay, I'm the same guy that winces when literally is used wrong. So <laughs> when I hear graphic novel, and I go, well, is this a novel? But it's not or is this the... grammatically the way. Well, no, not even grammatically. The way literally. Right. You mean the opposite. You mean metaphorically. Um, you mean figuratively. Uh, you literally died last night. I, I, I literally <laughs> died when hearing about it. Starving to death. <laughs> no, no. Um, I agree that comics is not a perfect term, but it is the term. 
um, in the same way that uh, perhaps, perhaps, cinema is a better term than going to the movies, because they're also the talkies, and they're also, now they're the 3D, 4D experience. Um, but comics, and I, in another way, I feel like we have won back the term comics, uh, in the same way that perhaps the term queer has been won back. Um, it could be will. It would have to be willful to be misconstrued. I honestly, I I love the term. Mm -hmm. uh, I really do. And part of it's because part of it has to do with the the, the Sunday strip bunnies, uh, you know, context that comes with that. And well, I'll then hand some of my students who are a little irate with me in a college classroom that I'm giving them a comic book, and we start to look at the Americanization process as seen in American Born Chinese and Ghost, which adopt a very cartoonish style, and they look like they're written for kids, and then they start to see what's really going on, and that's, that's kind of messed up, that what's happening. <laughs> Wait, this, I, and, I, and I ask them, I'm like, would you let your, would you let your 10 year old read this comic? And, no, no, this is, this, this, well, why not? Well, I would, maybe this one, but not that one. And so, like, they start to have to, like, differentiate a little bit between what's okay and what's, yeah, and this is all comics, that's the fun part of it, it subverts their expectations, and I like watching them see that happen with themselves. I, I like the term. Uh, graphic novel, I just, okay, so it's a full length, you know, it's a novel, but it's in comic format, I guess that's fine. Um, but it's not, I don't, I don't. It's one genre. It one drives genre. me yes. nuts when I see it apply. It's not the medium. Yeah, <laughs> comics it's comics a is, the, is the medium, comics is the language mm -hmm. uh, that a cartoonist uses to tell a story. And there are certain things that are uh, elements that are unique to that language, and that language is comics. Um, graphic novel is a, a term that's been applied to describe certain things. I'm actually sorry now that in 2005 I styled myself the graphic novels librarian, and I did style myself the graphic novels librarian because I was afraid to call myself the comics librarian. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's not a term that I that I enjoy, and I think comics is a is a more honest truer term for what we're talking about. And, okay, John, and then we'll probably have time for one more before we move on to the awards ceremony. Uh, a lot of uh, film studies, especially also literary studies even more, is, um, uh, is concerned with the auteur, the, the author, the single creator. How does this work in comics uh, when sometimes there are uh, there is very collaborative uh, media and sometimes they are single uh, authors. I mean, it, I think it depends on your background as a comics critic or a comics scholar. So my background is in studying novels. So I, I tend to be more interested in the auteur model, the um, cartoonist who both writes and draws um, him or herself, um, you know, what I'm reading. So, so that's me. But this has been a kind of contentious issue in comic studies. Um, do you guys have thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I, you know, one thing that's really interesting, um, if you ever get a chance to like look at original artwork for comics pages, you can even see how lettering itself, which is so overlooked, um, can be its own form of artwork, right? In terms of balloon placement. I have one issue, and this is, but you, you know. But you can see that in auteurist work or in collaborative you, work, You right? can, yeah. and I think with comics, I, I really like it. And you can, particularly with the collaborative side, that's what interests me, is when I see the teams coming together. To see the way in which the the letter is going to you know place certain artwork to help direct the eye, uh, not distract the art. When you look at uh, colorists, you know, and you think about the way in which the colorist helps tell a story in big tone, um, that when you hear from artist writers who are telling the story, but they're not doing the color of this particular one, how it changes. I, I don't know. I, I, for me, I'm much more interested in how comics can be a collaborative form. Yeah. What's interesting is that you bring up film studies, which is film is a medium far more collaborative than, <laughs> than comics. You've got hundreds of people involved in creating the work. So, you know, auteur theory comes from a specific lens. Uh, there are many other ways to look at film, and I think that. Uh, lens. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was enjoying your wordplay. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had known that I was making it. Um, so, I mean, I think you can do the same thing with comics. Uh, you know, 
you could conceivably look at uh, certain mainstream uh, collaborative works from an auteur theory looking at editors, you know, yeah. who's putting it all together. You know, yeah. I mean, you can pull any one person out of that and kind of see if that's the person you feel has imposed his or her vision on a larger story. In fact, with, with the scholarship I did for my book on the superhero afterlife, um, I liked turning into the skin on this. I like looking at what persists across creative teams and across different editorial regimes. What sticks? And in that way, I could look to genre theory about who is actually shaping this character. If I just pin it on Chris Claremont, well, that could be useful in one sense, but in another sense, I'm of this more author function idea, where you have a mass of people over time that contribute to something that they're gravitationally pulled to. So uh, it doesn't have to operate as even a weakness if your lens, if your uh, work can utilize it, then it's useful. And actually, bringing up Chris Claremont is an interesting example because in his archives, he has project files for every project, and you can see, um, you know, what changes the art went through, what changes the editor made, uh, because it's all there. You can trace that process and see who is the person whose inspiration was behind this character or this uh, plot turn. <coughs> Sorry, I just joked. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a group. <laughs> Use their mutant power <laughs> to choke Karen. I'd like you to exit uh, immediately. Karen, do you mind if we move on to the please, next question? Please, please, please. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's maybe a meta. I mean, we're at the comic sites. We're a panel, of course. Yeah, go for it. But I guess the thing I'm wondering is, I mean, it's clear that comic studies is building this momentum in terms of just uh, general perception of legitimacy. Legitimacy. Um, so as it becomes increasingly institutionalized, um, I guess I'm curious about like what you see as the pluses and minuses of that happening. Like where might comics studies lose some of what it has right now in terms of being a multidisciplinary, radical kind of rigorous practice, and what made what way in what ways might it maintain that even though it becomes more institutionalized? Well, I think we can touch on it in terms of. You know, if, if we can add, say, four sections of a, a comics course to our department, then we're going to bring in students, right? I've got to make sure my course descriptions are intriguing enough to bring in the students. And that may dictate reading selections. That may dictate areas of study. And you, you do run a little bit of a risk of market dictating content. And that's, that's kind of a fight that you know, we have to deal with. I think that's one potential problem. I mean, this, this might not be exactly what you were asking, but um, I get a lot of people complaining because I have been a person within academia who has done a lot of field building around comic studies, that um, academia is going to sort of sap the vitality from comics. And I just couldn't disagree more.
has to be to write about them, I need to show you how to write about comics. And that works fine for my students. I think I do an okay job of it. Um, but I got to thinking about this as I was hearing the discussions. People don't talk about the art. They don't know how to talk about the art. They don't know how to talk about the medium as a medium. Uh, superheroes are not the medium. And all these other different issues. You know, we see continual issues of, um, for, well, one of the chapters is called uh, Dealing with Bro Culture. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, and, and, and shocker, shocker, there are more than just, you know, white heterosexual men reading comics. So, you know, maybe we need to talk about comics from different perspectives. And that's what this collection is going to be focused on. And my, my directive to the contributors was that this is not going to be a traditional academic audience. We're not writing for, you know, graduate students. This is going to be geared for mainstream readers. This is something that we should visualize high school teachers giving to their high school students and helping them to better analyze their books. Uh, it could be something used in a survey course in an undergrad class. This could be given from editors to their upcoming bloggers so that they can have a better clue. I mean, too many times have I read in a USA article, uh, HuffPost, where they talk about the comics. No, no, they talk about the story. They don't talk about the actual article. So that way the editor can say, if you want to be the pop culture reviewer, then you need to go read this before you publish on comics. So, we're hoping tentatively to have a uh, 2017 publication date on this, um, but I'm pretty excited about it, and I think it's something that should be really accessible, um, and it should hopefully answer one of the questions out there, because I don't think there are too many books at all out there on actually how to write about comics. Thank you very much, Horace. And I'd like to invite to our screens, if you could see them, uh, Mr. Robert Jones. Robert, can you hear me? Okay, we can't necessarily hear you, but we can see you, which is wonderful. Um, and that could be a problem on my end. Just give me one moment. I've invited... Oh, hello. Let's take it off mute. There we go. Hi, Robert. Can you hear us now? We are inviting Robert here today because he has uh, won the honorable mention for uh, his work on Cyborg. You can see him on your displays here. Uh, Robert, we really uh, appreciate your contributing your work. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say about it to make people more acquainted with it? Um, well, I wrote an essay uh, about Cyborg in the that were submitted, and it was uh, fantastic. Robert, they can follow you on Twitter as Son of Baldwin? Yes. Okay. You can see him. He can't see you, so can he at least hear a round of applause? to bring in one last voice here. This is, should be Anastasia Salter. Anastasia, can you hear me? Maybe. Uh, I'll mention here at the outset that Anastasia, oh, that's better, that uh, uh, Anastasia is one of the co-editors for a issue on, um, for the Digital Humanities Quarterly that came out in 2015. And if I can bring her up on the call, I'll let, oh, I'll invite her to the call. <laughs> Technology at work, there we go. Uh, and she oversaw, along with her co-editor, uh, just a remarkable array of different contributors. Is everybody enjoying mice? Yes. I believe we have Anastasia on the line. Anastasia, can you hear us? 
Oh, we'd like to just start quickly by congratulating you and your whole team for the Digital Humanities Quarterly Issue for winning the Box Prize today. Congratulations. You can't see all the people that are here with us, but could we also give Anastasia and her team a quick round of applause? It's a large collective, yes. Um, in the time, and we only have a minute or two left, but Anastasia, is there anything you want to say either about your work specifically or working in comic studies? Excellent. Before we say goodbye to Anastasia, it would be remiss of me not to thank our panelists here today who shared their time and their thoughts, and to thank Robert as well, and to thank all of you for coming. So, one last round of applause for our panelists. And our thank you all so much. Goodbye, everyone.